Pastor Rich is taking the evening off to be with family, and aren't we blessed to have such a wonderful senior pastor and Jordy, his wife, amen. And so I'm honored after a couple of weeks of being away from you all on vacation, uh, I had a little staycation where I did absolutely nothing. I was the epitome of a couch potato right here, I tell you what. But it was nice just to be able to rest and hang out with my family, and now we get to be in God's Word together, and I'm really excited about this opportunity to be in God's Word with you tonight. We're going to be taking a break from our study in the book of, of Genesis, and we're going to be looking at the book of Judges tonight, a, a passage that we're all familiar with, Judges 16, verses 1 through 22. The title of my message tonight is More Than Conquerors. More than conquerors. Will you please join me as I pray? Father, I thank you for this privilege to be in your word right now. Father, you're inspired in errant, holy word. And Father, I pray that we would give your word the proper place in our hearts. Lord, that we would see that it's not just merely words on a page, it's life. And Father God, it's a roadmap to life in our lives. And that life is found in Christ. And so we pray that you will anoint this time, that you will build us up in our faith and be glorified, that as a result of being in your presence and in your word, we will leave tonight different, changed, more like Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. You know, last night, Heidi and I were putting our daughter Melina down to bed, and uh, before she goes to bed, we always read the Bible together, and we pray. And so last night, we happened to be, of all places, in Judges 16. And I'm reading through this whole story of Samson and Delilah, and I'm looking at my daughter's eyes, and she's like, okay, Delilah's not very nice, is she? You know, and she's just processing. You can see this five-year-old mind just processing the whole story and at the end I'm trying to bring some kind of application for her at her level you know what does this mean to you as a five-year-old and I'm kind of shooting from the hip here you know I'm on the fly and I said to her well it's obvious that you need to pick good friends right <laughs> because good friends wouldn't want to hurt you and she's like yes daddy but you know, as I'm looking at this passage, I'm sure you would agree, there's so much more here than just who you pick as your friend. You know, in Romans chapter eight, verse 37, there is a verse here that ties in powerfully with what we're gonna study tonight. Look at these words with me, it says, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. If you don't have that verse underlined in your Bible, please do so. Just make sure it's your Bible before you do so. How many of us believe this verse is true? Show of hands. Amen and amen. But let me ask the question in a different way. Do you also believe these words when it is applied to your greatest area of personal struggle? See, that's the key. As Christians, we may acknowledge it's true, but many of us live in a constant state of defeat. And yet, as I look at this passage and as I look at God's word, I believe it is the Lord's will for the reality of this verse to be experienced daily by all, not just some, but all of his children. I believe we can overwhelmingly conquer all personal strongholds through Jesus Christ. But the big question, the elephant in the room is this, how? Tonight we're gonna to look at the life of Samson and discover three principles. This is where the rubber hits the road here for conquering the temptations that frequently conquer us. Let's begin in verse one. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. When it was told to the Gazites, saying Samson has come here, 
they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept silent all night saying, let us wait until the morning light, then we will kill him. Now Samson lay until midnight and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the city gate and the two posts and pulled them up along with the bars. Then he put them on his shoulders and carried them up to the top of the mountain which is opposite Hebron. After this it came about that he loved a woman in the valley of Shorek whose name was Delilah. The lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, entice him and see where his great strength lies and how we may overpower him that we may bind him to afflict him. So then each of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength is and how we may bound you, how you may be bound to afflict you. Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh cords that have not been dried, then I will become weak like any other man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh cords that had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now, she had men lying in wait in an inner room, and she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the cords as a string of toes snaps when it touches fire. So his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you've deceived me and told me lies. Now please tell me how you may be bound. He said to her, If they bind me tightly with new ropes which have not been used, then I will become weak and be like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. For the men were lying in wait in the inner room, but he snapped the ropes from his arms like a thread. <laughs> then Delilah said to Samson, Up to now you've deceived me and told me lies. Tell me how you may be bound. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my hair with the web and fasten it with a pin, then I will become weak like any other man. So while he slept... Delilah took the seven locks of his hair and wove them into the web. And she fastened it with the pin and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep, pulled out the pin of the loom and the web. Verse 15. Then she said to him, How can you say, I love you, when your heart is not with me? You have deceived me these three times and have not told me where your great strength is. And it came about when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him that his soul was annoyed to death. So he told her all that was in his heart and said to her, a razor has never come on my head. For I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I will become weak like any other man. Verse 18, when Delilah saw that he told her all that was in his heart, she sent and called the Lord of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all that is in his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. She made him sleep on her knees. And called for a man that had and had him shave off the seven locks of his hair. Then she began to afflict him, and his strength left him. She said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes. And they brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze chains, and he was a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow after it was shaved off. When we read the book of Judges, we see that God raised up Samson to be a judge, or to put it in a different way, a deliverer. When we read the book of Judges, you see that they go through these cycles of sin, and whenever they fail and God brings judgment upon them, 
Then they begin to cry out to the Lord, and he raises up a deliverer to deliver them from their enemies. Samson was one of their deliverers. The Holy Spirit was upon this man in a powerful, powerful way. But in many ways, Samson was symbolic of the entire nation of Israel as a whole at that time. You see, he was in a covenant relationship with God, which means great promises. Whenever you read the promises of God to Israel, great promises of blessing when there is obedience. But there were also promises of judgment for disobedience. And when I look at Samson, I see a man who has all this potential because of that covenant relationship with God. God is for him. God is for Israel. There is so much available if they would just seize the opportunity. But his character was lacking and his heart was divided. And unfortunately, there are times when we can look like Samson. So how can we avoid his example and be more than conquerors? The first thing, if you're taking notes, that I'd like to have you write down is this. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. If you want to be more than a conqueror, then set apart Christ as Lord, not just of a compartment in your heart, all of it. He is worthy of all of us, amen? We are not our own. We have been bought with a price. He's redeemed us with his blood. We just don't give him a cleaned up corner in the room of our hearts. He deserves it all. Sanctify Christ as Lord of your heart. Not just that he's your savior, he must be Lord. Let him reign. And when we do that, we make no provision for the flesh. I'm choosing to walk in the spirit because I've sanctified Christ as Lord in my heart. Therefore, when the flesh raises up its ugly head and wants its way, I say no because this heart belongs to Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Romans 13. Romans 13, verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. It's a choice. It's a daily choice. Sometimes it's a moment-by-moment choice. When the enemy begins to press in, brothers and sisters, those are the times we press into the Lord. This heart belongs to Jesus. You know, you look at Samson. He's looking for trouble, and you see it in verses 1 through 3. And you know, here's the deal. Whenever someone looks for trouble, they're going to find it. You will always be successful whenever you're looking for trouble. It just is what it is. He goes to Gaza, and we see Gaza in the news today. That's where we see all the uprisings going on. But in that day, what was it? It's the Mediterranean version of Daytona Beach, Florida, during spring break. It's, it's New Orleans during Mardi Gras, okay? Dangerous, dangerous place. And there he met a harlot, and he had sex with her. The Bible calls it out for what it is. And here's the deal. Samson's problems were obvious to all. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I can deliver myself mentality he had. But Samson was blinded by his lust and pride long before he was blinded by the Philistines. And here's the deal. He got away with it. Or so he thought. And isn't that part of our problem too? You know, sometimes we sin and we think we're getting away with it. No one will know. Maybe Google, but it's none of their business anyway. That was a joke. Kind of work with me there, people. (laughs) Or if we get caught, we think we can get ourselves out of it. You know? One of the best things that can ever happen is to get caught. 
one of the worst things that ever can happen is to get away with it, or so you think. And it reminds me of when I was a sixth grader. First day of summer, June 20th, I was hanging out with a friend, and we were walking around the different stores in this one particular area in Everett, Washington, and we went into this little store called Olson's Supermarket, now out of business. And I don't know what came over me, but back in the day, I had a real craving for M&Ms. Anyone like M&Ms? Because they melt in your mouth, not in your hands. (laughs) At least that's what the slogan is, but you know, if you hold it long enough, Red, green, brown, you know, you know the story, right? And I had a craving for M&Ms. In fact, I looked like an M&M back then. I'm just kidding. Anyway, since that last Google joke didn't work, I thought I'd throw that one in real quick. So I'm in the store, my friend's on another aisle, and I'm in the candy aisle, and there, behold, right in front of me, my favorite M&Ms. I graduated to Snickers, but back then it was M&Ms. And I looked this way, and I looked that way, and I happened to notice this one man in plain clothes walking that way down the aisle, but I really thought I was all alone. And when no one was looking, I put the M&Ms under my jacket. It was June 20th, but I was still wearing a jacket because it's summer in the Northwest. And I walked out the store. And the moment I hit the threshold of that store, that guy who walked by undercover police officer nabbed me. Come with me. And then they do this for shoplifters. They give them one call. (laughs) So I had to call my mom. And I'll never forget my mom's words when I told her I was caught for shoplifting. These were her words. Buddy, your summer is over. And in fact, it was. At that point, my summer was over. I tell you what. I was in so much trouble. But I'll tell you this, getting caught ended my life of crime. And I'll never forget that evening having to tell my dad. And my dad doesn't cry. But he began to tear up because he told me, I thought I had raised you better than that. And that touched my heart so much. I didn't want to grieve his heart ever again. The best thing that can ever happen is to get caught and not succeed in doing what is wrong. Proverbs 6, 27 through 28 says, Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? Oh, you may think you're getting away with it for a moment, but our God in heaven sees everything. And he's the one who settles all accounts. What we sow, we will reap, right? So what must we do? I wish Samson would have done this. It's something that we need to do if we want to be more than conquerors. We need to surrender our weaknesses to Christ, Surrender those weaknesses to Christ. You know the ones that we're talking about here. I'm not looking for testimonial time. I'm not asking you to raise your hand and say, this is the area I struggle with. We all know that we have an area that we're struggling with, or maybe more than one. And what I'm saying here is, is be transparent, be honest, bring it to the Lord. Surrender it to God. Well, how do I bring it to the Lord? By asking God for help. Notice what is said in Hebrews 2.18, for since he himself was tempted in all that he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Who is the writer of Hebrews speaking of? Jesus Christ. Jesus, when his children call out to him and say, I need your help, I need to overcome this temptation, our Savior is willing and able to save. He is ready for us when we call upon him. And his arm is not too short 
for nothing is too difficult for him. He is mighty to save. But the key is we need to own it. We need to take responsibility. We need to acknowledge that it exists and then watch what happens when we ask him for help. You know, in many ways, to ask God for help requires that we really surrender our will. We surrender our hopes, we surrender our dreams, we surrender our strengths, we surrender our weaknesses, we bring it all to him. And in many ways, it's a picture of a burnt offering in the Old Testament. You know, in the book of Leviticus, you had these different types of offerings, and there was this burnt offering that was brought, which was different than all the others because it was completely consumed on the altar. You know, some of the all offerings, you know, the priest could have a portion of it or the worshiper would have a portion of it. But when it came to the burnt offering, that was wholly devoted to the Lord. Now, now why do I bring that up? Because I see that pictured in Romans chapter 12, verses one and two. And I believe it ties in with this idea of surrender. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. What is Paul saying here? He is saying this that he wants us as worshipers of Jesus Christ to place our lives completely at the altar, a complete surrender. Lord, you have it all. You gave it all because you gave your son Jesus Christ for me. How can I withhold anything from you? You deserve it all, and in fact, I will take it one step further. Life is meant to be lived in a posture of surrender and we find life to the full when we surrender to the will of God. Amen. Oh Lord, I, I give it all to you. How wrong of me to hold it back. What do we gain if we hold anything back from the Lord? Zip. Maybe some regret. Oh, but if we give it to the Lord. There's liberty, there's freedom, there's joy, amen? And Paul's saying that's where it's at, worshiper. If you wanna worship God in spirit and truth, lay it all at the altar, bring it all to him, including the weaknesses. Including the weaknesses, because God knows those, and he wants to help you with them. It reminds me of a, a former coworker that I had Back in the day, I was going to college, and I was talking with one of my coworkers at Levitt's Furniture. And he began to talk to me about how he came to faith in Jesus Christ, and it was just a beautiful story. He was doing repairs on furniture, stops at a rest stop in, in Washington, and here's a group of people huddled together and praying. So he was inquisitive and wanted to find out what was going on. That group led him to faith in Jesus Christ. Well. Years later, we were talking again, and at this point, he's married and has a child. And I'll never forget this conversation. He said, you know, my wife is married to a former homosexual. Was your wife married before you? No, she is married to a former homosexual. Really, what happened? And he began to tell me the story of how the Lord began to move on his life and show him the way where life is truly found in Christ. And I said, well, you're living in Seattle. And Seattle, like any city, has all these areas where there's opportunity for failure. And sometimes your work even takes you into those areas. What do you do? I'll never forget his counsel, and it's wise counsel for you and me. It's that picture of surrender. He said, I always make sure if I have to go to those areas, I never go alone. So that way, I don't stumble. Great word. But that's what I'm talking about here. I'm surrendering. I'm bringing everything to the Lord. Because here's the reality, guys. 
We know where we're going before we get there, right? We know what we're looking for before we go there. And if you're looking for trouble, you'll find it. Sanctify Christ as Lord of your heart. Here's the deal. If we don't surrender our weaknesses to the Lord, we're allowing the enemy to set a bigger trap. And that's what we see with Samson in verses 4 through 16. And I want to capture this section this way, that we need to pursue Christ. I'm setting apart my heart for Christ, but daily I'm also moving forward in Christ. I'm pursuing Christ or pursuing righteousness with all that I am, with all of my heart. You see, Samson was a Nazarite from birth, which meant there was supposed to be no wine, no grapes, nothing associated with the vine, no contact with anything that is dead, which I would find quite easy, right? I don't want to touch it, it's dead. No haircuts. I find this one easy too. Anyway, I'll leave that one alone. (laughs) But the idea here is a symbolic of total devotion to the Lord through a covenant relationship. He's supposed to be set apart. It's about a relationship with God, this covenant relationship. But we see in verse 4 that Samson had an appetite for forbidden fruit. Shorek, the name of the city where Delilah lived, Guess what that means? It means chosen vine. That should be a red flag for any Nazarite. Delilah meant devoted one, but the question is, devoted to what? Definitely not to Samson or his God or Samson's welfare. And in verse 5, we see here that Samson, the Philistines wanted to make a trophy of Samson. And I bring this up because Satan wants to make a trophy out of us too. He wants to display our failures in his trophy case along with other defeated saints so that he can whisper to others, you can't overcome just like so-and-so didn't overcome. It reminds me of a season in my life when I was going to the University of Washington, I began to really just play around in the world. I mean, it was bad and getting worse. It was affecting my grades. It was affecting my job performance. I almost lost my job. It was getting really, really dark, really bad. I had fallen so far away from the Lord. And I had this friend at the time. His name was Bob, very handsome guy. We bought motorcycles. We did a lot of things together, hung out together. But in that season, through my father, I came back to the Lord. I began to see what was going on, and it's like, man, I got to make a choice because where I'm going is a fast track to nowhere. I'm in big trouble if I keep going this way. And my dad confronted me one morning, and it literally was a pivot in my life, one of those pivotal moments that changed me forever when he confronted me about my faith because he was the one who originally led me to faith in Jesus Christ. Well, I kind of fell out of touch with my friend Bob because I knew if we got together where we'd go, but he kept on pinging me, hey, let's get together, let's get together. Well, his parents had bought him and his brother a big, huge place down in the U District in Seattle. And that night, they were gonna have a party, and it was gonna be a big party. And I'd made up my mind, I'm gonna go there, and I'm gonna tell him I'll be your friend, but I can't keep doing what I used to do because I've rededicated my life to Jesus Christ. So I went a little bit late, hoping that the place had cleared out. That didn't happen. And then I started talking to Bob. He says, hey, you want to have a beer? I said, no, I I can't do that. I don't want to do that. He looked at me like, what are you talking about, Dodd? What's up with you? I said, I'm not going to do that. I've rededicated my life to Jesus Christ. And the, the cynical look that came on his face, I will never, ever forget He started laughing, and he pointed to a guy across the room. He says, see that guy over there? You're going to be just like him. He went to Young Life Camp, and look at him now. He's drunker than anyone else here. And he said, even my girlfriend. Oh, she came to faith in Jesus Christ, but look at her. You're going to be just like everyone else. And in my heart, it's like, no, Lord. I don't want to be a trophy on the mantle of Satan's 
I don't want that. I said, no, it's gonna be different. Funny thing is, is several years later, I found his motorcycle helmet that I'd borrowed and I gave him a call. And lo and behold, he's still living with his parents. Failure to launch, you know? Had it all, had it easy, street. And he said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm now assistant pastor of a church. And we began to talk. At one point in the conversation, he used the name of the Lord in vain. But then he apologized. And I thought, thank you, Lord. I wasn't like those guys. We don't have to be that way. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen? Let us be on the mantle of the Lord. Let the Lord point to us and say, look at what my spirit can do in a person in bringing transformation to their lives. My son and daughter, they are more than conquerors through him who loved them. Amen? That's where it's at. But here's the deal. Samson couldn't see the warning signs because he was trying to serve two masters, his God and his lusts. And Jesus told us in Matthew 6, 24, we're gonna study it this week, and in fact, no one can serve two masters for he'll either hate the one and love the other or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We can't ride the fence if you're going to be in with God, then be in with God. Amen? Be on fire for the Lord. Make no provision for the flesh. Pursue righteousness with all of your heart. I want that. How about you? Then may it be reflected in our prayers. One of my favorite prayers is found in Psalm 86, verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Look at the request here as well. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. That's a prayer. Lord, teach me your way, and his way will lead us towards an undivided heart towards him. When we understand how great he is, how awesome the blessings are, what a valuable relationship we have with him, everything else in the world pales in comparison. Give me that undivided heart. And then take it one more step with another prayer request. Pray for a godly appetite. Pray for a godly appetite. Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. You know, the things of the world look like they satisfy. And maybe they satisfy for a moment, but there's always regret and emptiness afterwards. But if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, brothers and sisters, you will be satisfied. There will be a contentment that you will not find anywhere else in the world. So pray for an undivided heart. Pray for a godly appetite. And then make choices to fill your heart with godly thoughts. Psalm, or rather, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. You know, when I was on vacation, I had to make a conscious choice not just to turn my phone off, but sometimes to turn the news off. Because I find that very discouraging. Now, I know the end of the story. It's gonna get worse before it gets better, before Jesus Christ comes again. And if you didn't know that, sorry to burst your bubble, but that's what the Bible says. It's gonna get worse. And when we look at our culture today, it is getting worse. We need Jesus. And so there'll be times where instead of listening to the news while I'm exercising, I'm listening to worship. And I could just feel my spirit lifted up, my heart encouraged as I'm thinking the thoughts of the Lord, as I'm in his word, that's where we need to be. Next we see here with Samson, and I wanna capture it this way, we need to flee and not flirt with temptation. That's what Samson's doing here. He's seeing how close he can get to the fire without getting burned. He pursued his fleshly appetites, he flirted with temptation. Notice how he gets closer to the truth when answering Delilah. Verse seven, bind me with seven fresh cords. 
kind of close to this idea that his hair's never been touched before. Then bind me with new ropes. Ropes Again, this idea of something that's pristine, never been touched before. And then he comes to the third one, verse 13, and he's really close here. He says, weave the seven locks of my hair with the web and fasten it with the pen. Now he's really close. He's pointing out the nature of that relationship. And if the hair is touched, the relationship symbolically is broken. Now notice Delilah's tactics. Verse 15, how can you say I love you? How many people have given away what they can never get back after hearing those manipulative words? Then she pressed him daily, verse 16. Isn't that like the enemy? Oh, just because you say no once doesn't mean he's not going to come back again. He's going to keep coming and coming and coming again until you fall. And then he's going to throw it in your face and say, I told you so, trophy. And here we're told in verse 16, his response, his soul was annoyed to death. But it didn't draw him to the Lord. He continued to flirt. You see, Samson should have seen the warning signs. I mean, let's think about this. Every time she does something to him, then she cries out, behold, the Philistines are upon you. Do you think that's a healthy relationship here? You know, when she's asking questions like, tell me how you may be bound so I may afflict you. I don't think that's healthy, okay? And I'm waiting for Samson to stop her and say, hey there, Delilah. What's going on here? What's really at the heart of this? But he kept coming back for more. Just like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool that goes back to his folly. Like Samson, many of us try to resist temptation when we should be fleeing from it instead. You see, flirting with temptation only opens us up to failure. When we flirt with temptation, we are deceiving ourselves into thinking we'll have the strength to say no in the heat of the moment or that we will know when to quit. And here is the key. Quit before you start. We're all grown-ups here. We all know where it will go, right? Don't go there. Because if you're looking for trouble, you'll find it. Sanctify Christ as Lord of your heart. You see, don't walk in the shadows, walk in the light. Don't play on the devil's playground. Stay where the Lord is. You know, a great comparison contrast is Joseph, the son of Jacob. When you compare and contrast Samson and Joseph, you see the same tactics of the enemy, but different outcomes. Now, Joseph was a handsome man. We're told him he was handsome in, in form and face. I mean, he was, a, he was a knockout kind of guy. You know, he's the kind of guy you want your daughters to bring home. And God had put his favor upon Joseph. And in Potiphar's home, after he was sold into slavery, Potiphar recognized the hand of God on him too and raised him up. So basically, he was in charge of everything, so much so that Potiphar didn't concern himself with anything in the house as long as Joseph was in charge. Well, Potiphar's wife gets eyes for Joseph while Potiphar's away. And she says, hey, come and lie with me. And I love what Joseph did there. He, he doesn't flirt with the temptation. He calls it out. And he says, you know what? My master has put everything under my charge. I'm in charge of everything. But I am not permitted to have you because you're his wife. And then he says, and how could I do this wicked thing against my God? He called it out. He's bringing light into the darkness. He's not playing on the devil's playground. He's playing where the Lord is, the safe place. Well, does she stop? No. Day after day, she pressured him like Delilah. But did he get annoyed to death? 
No, the word says he would not be alone to, with her. He would not listen to her. He avoided her like the plague because he knew where this would go. Well, finally, once she realized that all of her tactics weren't working, she shooed away all the servants, got them alone, and then said, come and lie with me. All the excuses are gone. No one's gonna know. What did he do? He left his cloak in her hands and fled the scene. He may have lost a cloak that day, but he kept his integrity, one scholar said. That's how it's done. You don't flirt with it. You don't see how close you can get to the flames without getting burned. You flee. I love Joseph. 2 Timothy 2.22, Paul says this to Timothy. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Righteousness, faith, love, and peace never produce regrets. And God's faithful, by the way. He always provides an escape route whenever his children are tempted. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also that you may be able to endure it. And the question is, what is the way of escape? Jesus Christ is our escape route. The name of the Lord's a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. If you are being tempted, call upon the Lord. You flee that situation and you call upon the Lord so you don't go back to that situation. I'm gonna stand on the Lord's playground. I'm not going back to the devil's playground because I don't wanna be a trophy on the devil's mantle. Amen? I'm a vessel for godly use. I belong to the Lord. Lastly, we see in verses 17 through 22, I wanna capture it this way. I believe we as believers in Jesus Christ, if we're gonna be more than conquerors, it's not just a one-time inoculation. It's not just a, a one-time shot in the arm. We need to continually strengthen ourselves in Christ. Why? Because our strength is not enough. And maybe it's because I'm getting older, 52 now. I know, seriously. Don't let the smoke and mirrors fool you, okay? 52. And the older I get, the more I realize, you know what? My strength is not what it used to be physically. You know, you just feel diminished. And the enemy wants to capitalize on those times. Anyone feel like you're strong all day long and then nighttime, that strength begins to diminish? Can I get a witness there from anybody? Help me, please. Tell me that I'm not alone. Isn't that the way the enemy plays, though? More than a conqueror. From 8 till 8 p.m. More than a sinner from 8 p.m. on, right? So easy. The enemy wants to play upon those opportunities. Our strength is not enough. And flirting with temptation wore Samson down, verse 17. Delilah, she says, Basically to the guys, this is a Matthew Dodd paraphrase. She says to the lords of the Philistines, show me the money. Because Samson had told her all that was in his heart. And look at this picture. She lulls him to sleep on her lap. That's a picture of Satan right there. Lulling us into a complacency. And that's why Peter warns in 1 Peter 5, 8, 9, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone devour, to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. In verse 19, his hair is cut, which is a, a symbol of a broken relationship. Samson's power, by the way, was not in his hair, but in his relationship with the Lord. And unfortunately, he was the last to know when the Lord had left. But I want to say this here, because this is under the Old Covenant. And the Holy Spirit was given for a different reason in the Old Covenant than he is in the New Covenant. 
In the Old Covenant, not every Israelite had the Holy Spirit indwelling them or empowering them. The Holy Spirit was given to specific people for a specific task or purpose. And often, once that task was completed, the Holy Spirit was removed, okay? But for us as believers in Jesus Christ, the moment we receive Jesus as our Savior, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not in Jesus Christ. You're not a Christian. So we do not have to fear the loss of the Holy Spirit, though, I will say this, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit, but he'll never leave us because even after we fail, his whole desire is to bring us back to a place of healing, a place of renewal and strength. My strength is not enough. Your strength is not enough, but I'm here to tell you Christ's strength is more than enough. If you take anything away, Going back to that idea of being more than a conqueror, Christ's strength is more than enough. Samson was overcome, he was ruined, and then he realized the strength that he had came from the Lord. And Jesus puts it this way in regards to the new covenant for us as believers, John 15, four and five, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Oh, how we need the Lord. And I love what the Apostle Paul discovered. He had this thorn in the flesh, and he asked the Lord three times to take it away. But the Lord said to him that he wasn't gonna take that thorn in the flesh away because God's power is perfected in the weakness. And when we're weak, when we're not relying on our own strength, then we're strong because God is strong in us. Second Corinthians 12, nine, God said, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And this is why as I get ready to close here, I wanna encourage all of us to bring those weaknesses to the Lord because that's where we'll see the victory. That's when we'll become more than a conqueror. And, and maybe you're here tonight and you're feeling all battered and bruised, charred, beaten up, whatever term you wanna use. And I'm here to tell you, God is a God of new beginnings. He wants to make all things new and he wants you to experience his victory. Even Samson did. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is in verse 22. It says this, however, the hair of his head began to grow after it was shaved off. Kind of a double entendre there, right? <laughs> but, but what's going on here? It's this idea of a renewal of relationship. God's not done yet. And I'm here to tell you, you're not a trophy of Satan. Tonight's the night you come off that mantle. You're a vessel of the Lord. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen? That's not who you are. You're a child of God. God loves you. He's for you. He's not against you. Yes, you may have stumbled. Yes, you may have fallen badly. But our God wants to heal and restore our lives. You are not a trophy on the devil's mantle. You are more than a conqueror. And you will become more than a conqueror once you realize that failure doesn't define you. Jesus Christ does. Amen? Philippians 4.13, Paul puts it this way. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. How many of us want to be a vessel used of the Lord for honorable purposes, amen? We want the Lord to be glorified through our lives. Then let's make tonight the night where we say, enough of the devil's playground. I'm not a trophy on his mantle. I'm more than a conqueror through him who loved me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word.
And we pray, Father God, right now, we know the enemy has has had many victories. We've conceded many victories. But your word says something different for us, that you love us with an everlasting love, that you're for us and not against us, and that if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're here tonight, brothers and sisters, I just believe it's an opportunity for us to say, Lord, I wanna be more than a conqueror, but I'm not gonna ask that you raise your hand if you want, not because anyone else is. Would you just stand up and say, Lord, that's for me. This is a new beginning. I'm gonna stand. I'm gonna take my stand because I'm not a trophy on the enemy's mantle. I wanna stand up. Would you just stand up right now and just declare to the Lord, Lord, I'm yours. I don't care what other people think. This is between me and you. This is a God moment right now. I am yours. I surrender. I want to be more than a conqueror. Father, I thank you for the brothers and sisters who are making their stand, not in their own strength, but in the strength that you give them through the Holy Spirit. And I pray right now that every area of bondage in the name of Jesus Christ would be broken. I pray that you would loose the shackles of anyone who's been in bondage, no matter what the situation is. Father, that you would bring about deliverance, that you'd bring about healing, that you'd bring about hope. Instead of them being stuck in a rut, going down the same path over and over again, they would go the way, the truth, and the life that is found in Jesus Christ. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would also reveal the lies of the enemy and defeat every single one of them with your truth. We stand on your truth. Your word is truth tonight. We pray that you will heal marriages. We pray that you will deliver from addictions. We pray, Father, that you will change attitudes, prejudices, whatever's in our heart, that, Father, is a stronghold, that is a stumbling block. We're praying for your deliverance because we know that you're mighty to save, you're able to save, and you desire to set your people free. So we give our lives to you and we thank you for the victory that we have even now. And we choose to apply these principles every moment of every day as we let your word richly dwell within us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's